I discussed earlier how Shakespeare wanted to strengthen Rosalind's character, create a special bond between her and the audience, and how he cut Lodge's scene in which she needs to be rescued from bandits by men. However, that is not to say that Shakespeare's Rosalind does not have moments of weakness of her own. And actually, Shakespeare goes further than Lodge when describing his heroine's reaction to some serious injuries sustained by her loved one. In Lodge's Rosalind, the narrator describes Ganymede as having tears in her eyes and passions in her heart to see her Rosada so pained. Following his initially one-man attack on the rascals that wanted to sell the fair shepherdess Aliena to the king. A little later in the story, whilst Aliena and Ganymede are unfolding their flocks, they are far more active shepherdesses than their Shakespearean equivalents. Ganymede struggles to attain any peace of mind, sorrowing for the wounds of her Rosada, not quite in thought till she might hear of his health. But Shakespeare develops these feelings of grief and anxiety. In Act 4, Scene 3, Oliver recounts the story of Orlando's battle with the lion, his wounds sustained. The lioness had torn some flesh away, which all this while had bled, and produces a napkin, dyed in his blood unto the shepherd youth that he in sport of call his Rosalind. At the production of this blood-stained proof that Orlando has a genuine reason for not keeping his promise, Rosalind dramatically fates, causing Aliena to cry out, Why, how now, Ganymede? Sweet Ganymede! Aliena's short, abrupt exclamations show her genuine concern at seeing her cousin fall to the ground, apparently unconscious, and show that this is a rare event that has just taken place in the Forest of Arnon, an action that hasn't been pre-planned or engineered by Rosalind. Shakespeare's addition of this scene moves the focus back from Orlando's strength onto both Rosalind's character and her disguise. In spite of apparently being able to play the role of a young man to perfection and the success of her disguise provokes questions about gender identities and to what extent they are artificial constructs, this reaction shows that Rosalind still possesses emotions which can override planned behaviour, something considered more characteristic of the female sex. Moreover, the fact that this takes place on stage creates dramatic excitement as the audience wonder whether this is going to be the moment in which Rosalind's true identity is finally found out. Oliver certainly seems a little suspicious at such an extreme reaction to the injury of what is supposed to be just a mere male friend. He makes this judgement. This was not counterfeit. There is too great testimony in your complexion that it was a passion of earnest. Rosalind's deathly paleness, her complexion, is a more revealing than bluffing phrases such as Ah, Sirrah, a body would think this was well counterfeited, and shows that there are limits to even the finest actor's ability to stay in role. For Shakespeare is interested in the theatricality of drama, in the unwritten temporary contract drawn up between audience and actors that what is taking place is, or at least represents, reality. In this scene, when Ganymede's disguise comes close to being discovered, the audience are reminded that what they're watching is a fiction, that actually it is not just Rosalind who is putting on a role, but all the men and women in front of them, or just men and boys in Shakespeare's day. They're not living the country life in the Forest of Arden in France, and perhaps all secretly yearning to return to more sophisticated existences in the court, but are wandering up and down on a small stage in London, Stratford, New York or Sydney. As a dramatist, Shakespeare embraces this willing deceit and often toys with it in a way which Lodge, as a prose writer, is unable to do. This is seen most notably in the two completely different endings to As You Like It and Lodge's Rosalind. In the final page of Rosalind, Lodge includes more Forest of Arden violence when Gerismond, Rosada and Saladin take on Torismond's army. The battle includes thrusts, and the now united brothers, Rosada and Saladin, so behave themselves that none nurse stand in their way, nor abide the fury of their weapons. Torismond is killed, the perverted reader enjoys the phallic imagery, and Lodge finishes his work with an explicitly moral message. Such as neglect their father's precepts incur much prejudice. The division in nature, as it is a blemish in nurture, so it is a breach of good fortunes. The virtue is not measured by birth, but by action. That younger brethren, though inferior in years, yet may be superior to honours. That concord is the sweetest conclusion, and amity betwixt brothers more forcible than fortune. 
Precepts are rules guiding behaviour and actions. And so Lodge is stating unambiguously that children who choose to disobey their father's instructions will bring significant problems upon themselves. Lodge continues in a similar vein by calling for concord, for peaceful agreements between families and arguing that what you do should determine whether you are a good person morally, not your genes and family bloodline. Shakespeare admits this final battle. After all, his Forest of Arden is a place in which the stereotypically female trait of ceaseless talking presides over conventionally male attributes of violence and aggression. And instead, remarkably, Jack's the boy, Sir Roland's second son, reveals that Duke Frederick did arrive at the Forest of Arden prepared to fight, but ended up meeting with an old religious man and being converted to a solitary monk-like existence. This is scarcely believable. Would a man fond of wrestling, power and bullying really want to go from one extreme of the spectrum to the other? But to condemn Shakespeare for a ridiculous twist in his plot misses the point. Shakespeare isn't interested in Duke Frederick by this point. He has played the role of cranky despot to perfection in the opening acts of the play and in doing so helped introduce the key themes of abuse of power and fraternal rivalry. But in Act 5, these themes no longer predominate and have been replaced by questions about gender and relationships between men and women. Duke Frederick simply isn't needed, and to have two warring brothers miraculously reunited, Orlando and Oliver have resolved their differences, might well be considered unrealistic and as sickly as many of Lodge's pastoral descriptions. Shakespeare simply needs him out of the way so good can prevail and the main characters can return to the court a little wiser and more intelligent perhaps following their experiences in the forest of Arden. With Duke Frederick out of the way and the happy ending marriage ceremonies completed and in Shakespeare these are led by Hymen, the ancient Greek god of marriage ceremonies rather than Rosaline's father as is the case in Lodge. Rosalind takes to the stage to deliver a wonderfully playful epilogue, the complete opposite to Lodge's precise moralising. She first self-consciously reflects on theatrical conventions. It is not the fashion to see the lady the epilogue, and in doing so emphasises that what they have seen on stage has been a fiction, and one in which a woman, or at least a boy playing a woman, has had an unusually large role to play. Following some imagery comparing wine and good plays, she directly addresses audience members as in this way. I charge you, O oh women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, O oh men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering none of you hates them, that between you and the women the play may please. The tone is light-hearted and the contrast between the seemingly forceful verb charge and the relaxed phrase as much of this play as please you is humorous and a world away from the elaborate dictatorial formality of phrases such as division in nature as it is a blemish in nurture so it is a breach of good fortunes in Lodge's final paragraph. So the key difference between the two texts perhaps lies in the different levels of freedom given to reader and audience. At the end of his prose text, Rosalind, Lodge thunders forth bombastic phrases reinforcing conventional Christian morality, whereas Shakespeare is more ambiguous. Yes, there are similar messages that there that can be taken on board, should you wish to do so, about authority, sibling rivalry, and the importance of love and harmony between all men, but preferably love of the sexual kind should be confined to male-female relationships, please. However, it's up to you whether you choose to take these messages on board. It is ultimately to quote Shakespeare's title, as you like it. With Shakespeare, you can... With Lodge, you can't. You've been watching Schofield on Shakespeare, exploring the Bard's transformation of Lodge's Rosalind. Thanks for watching.